All right. Good evening. Good to see you. We've been talking with a few of you here. Um, I think summer's arrived. Uh, we're feeling the, the change in temperatures now and the heat's coming on. And so we're going to have this for the next, what, six months or something like that. <laughs> and we'll have the, have the heavy heat. And, uh, but, you know, hey, someone that's lived up north and dealt with snow up in Wisconsin and everywhere else, uh, when, I, when I think about how hot it is, my mind goes back to shoveling snow and all that, and I think, yeah, I'll take the heat. So it's a much better. So anyway, we're glad that you're here tonight. We're on our, I think, third um, feast. Uh, tonight is the Feast of First Fruits, right? Isn't that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. And so we're going to look at that. If you have not got a listening guide, they're over there. Prayer bulletin is over there as well. We encourage you to take one, and that prayer bulletin, it's like... Our regular bulletins on Sunday to keep you abreast of what's going on in our church. For those of you watching online, you can do the same by going out to our website and and uh, pulling up the links, uh, follow the links, and get the information. You can get a prayer guide. You can get the uh, listening guide as well for tonight. And you can also, any of you, you can watch uh, these uh, on Wednesday nights or even Sunday mornings as well. We record them. They're out at our website. So if you want to watch or refer someone to watch, you can send them to our website. And I, what is it, Alan? Is it the uh, the YouTube si- or no? Yeah, the YouTube uh, symbol is what you click on to see watch. to see previous. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's on Facebook. Oh, okay. Oh, it's on Facebook too. So, but I know that you can go out and I think click on There's click the. On YouTube yeah, well. yeah, right. So if you go out to our website, you'll see at the top right hand corner the little YouTube icon. Click on it, and then it'll open up to a, a number of recordings that are out there, both Wednesday night and um, Sunday morning. So anyway, enough of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Alan and Marion are going to lead us in worship, and then we'll get into the Word tonight, okay? God, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. We thank you for the warmer weather. Uh, it's going to get hot, and uh, it'll be hot for a long period of time, Lord, but uh, I just, uh, I just thank you for all that you do, and uh, Lord, uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the change in seasons, the summer, and we're into extended heat here in the south, but uh, Lord, uh, we just so much appreciate all that you do for us. We thank you for being able to air condition a room such as this and uh, have it comfortable for us, and, and so you are such a great God. And uh, we, uh, we thank you and praise you for allowing us to be here tonight. I pray for the other things that are going on across this campus. we got kids running around. We've got youth. We've got men's and women's Bible studies. And so, Lord, uh, as we seek you uh, across this campus, Lord, I pray that, that your spirit would uh, move in our hearts, that uh, we would find you, and that we would hear what you want to tell us whether we're eight years old or 80, Lord, um, speak to us tonight. So God, we just thank you for this time that you've given us. We lift it up. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, and I pray that our offering is acceptable to you. Then as we open your word, as we look at the feasts, which really point us to Jesus, point your people to Jesus, um, the Jewish people, uh, Lord, I pray that we would glean from your word truths that we can apply to our lives, not that we would be knowledgeable about the feasts and and all of that, but Lord, uh, may we see the spiritual truth that's that's found in all of this. And uh, there are some ways that we can apply what we're reading and what we're seeing to our lives. May we do that, Lord, that we might be in conformance more and more to Christ, and that should be our goal. Thank you again for this time, Lord. We ask your blessings upon it. And we do so in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Alan, would you lead us? Amen. Well, so good to see you. Looking forward to singing together tonight. And, uh, you know, one of the things, especially that the psalmists kind of explore, is the beauty of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 27 of David where he writes, One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. In His temple, We serve a beautiful Savior, don't we? We're going to sing about it tonight. So let's sing together. Ferris, Lord Jesus. Ferris, Lord Jesus.
two more songs tonight <coughs> sorry about the coughing but at least it's not last Wednesday <laughs> that was a debacle for sure okay so um, a little bit hard tonight a little bit difficult on first fruits not a lot of music uh, I mean there's a lot of depth here I'm sure Steve will dig into that but uh, one of the things I think we can all agree on is that a kernel in the idea of the uh, feast of first fruits is that we give God our best and we give him our first not the leftovers not the blemished lamb but the best he deserves it and so we're going to sing about that in these two hymns so I invite you please to sing along with me come all Christians be committed to the service of the Lord make your lives for him more fitted tune your hearts with one accord come into his courts with gladness each his sacred vows renew turn away from sin and sadness be transformed with life anew of your time and talents give him they are gifts from God above to be used by Christians freely to proclaim his will. 
wondrous love. Come again to serve the Savior, tithes and offerings with you bring. In your work with him find favor, and with joy his praises sing. God's command to love each other is required of everyone. Showing mercy to each other mirrors his redeeming son. In compassion he has given of his love that is divine. On the cross sins were forgiven, joy and peace are fully thine. <laughs> so come in praise, help me out. Come in praise and adoration, all who on Christ's name believe. Worship Him with consecration, grace and love will you receive. For His grace give Him the glory, for the Spirit and the Word, and repeat gospel story till the world his name has heard and in my life Lord be glorified be glorified in my life Lord be glorified Remind you again to grab coffee or whatever you need over there. Please help yourself. This is a casual gathering, and uh, you are most welcome to, to get some coffee. Somebody got some packaged cookies or something over there, I noticed. I don't know whose those are or who they're for, but go ahead and grab you one anyway. I won't tell. Uh, okay, so last, last week we looked at a chart uh, which gave the calendar, both the, the, uh, the Hebrew calendar and the Gregorian calendar, based on the moon and the sun. Hebrew based on the lunar calendar, uh, the Greek calendar based on the, the sun. Uh, the Feast of Rashit 
is what we're looking at tonight. First fruits, celebrated on the 16th day of Nisan, uh, people offered a ripe sheaf bundle of barley to God as an act of dedicating that whole harvest to him. And Alan kind of referred to that. Uh, on Passover, what would happen is a, a sheaf would be marked, um, bundled, left standing in the field. And then the f- next day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the sheaf was cut and prepared for the offering on the Sabbath, or the, uh, the first of the week, the Sunday. So the third day then, uh, the uh, Rishit, or first fruits, that day, uh, the uh, Feast of the First Fruits, the p- priests then would wave that sheaf in the temple before the Lord. Uh, this would be, as I said, the first day of the week, Sunday. Uh, Jews now, relatively very few, celebrate Rashid, celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. Um, but it does have great significance in the New Testament church, and that's kind of what we're going to look at tonight. It's the day of what? What happened on that Sunday? That's right, resurrection, right? We just celebrated Resurrection Sunday just a few weeks ago. And so that is, uh, uh, it is this day in which we gather together for worship, uh, the Lord's Day. We, we do so because we celebrate a risen Savior and Lord. Um, a couple other tidbits of interesting facts about this day. This is the 16th day of Nisan. Look in Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. While the Israelites camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month. The day after Passover, they ate unleavened bread and roasted grain from the produce of the land. And the day after they ate from the produce of the land, the manna ceased. Since there was no more manna for the Israelites, they ate from the crops of the land of Canaan that year. So, if you remember, God provided the Hebrew people this food called manna. Does anyone remember what manna means, the word manna? We've talked about this on several occasions, so I'm testing how well you've listened to me in the past. It's not that we don't listen, we're old. Manna means, the literal translation of manna in Hebrew is, what is it? So, could you imagine that first day when manna was there? What, did they, what is that? I don't know. What is that? So people come, they see people gathered around. I think God's got a great sense of humor. And they're, you know, people are saying, what is it? What, I don't, what is it? And people say, what did they call it? They call it, what is it? They, so they see, they see how it just, it was like uh, the old telephone thing. I mean, I just, I, I chuckle every time I, I, I think about that, that, well, anyway, it is, <laughs> So the, the, this Sunday, this, uh, the day after Sabbath, the, the day of first fruits, when they um, uh, were ready to enter the promised land, that's the day that the manna ceased to be there for them. All right? It was the same day that Queen Esther, Esther, man, Esther risked her life by going to the king on behalf of the Jewish people to stop their potential annihilation, if you remember that. And of course, the most obvious and momentous event that happened on the 16th day of Nisa is what? Jesus arose from the grave, right? All right, we're going to look at that in a moment. All right, we're going to talk first about the significance of the moon, okay? Remember now the, the Hebrew calendar is based on the lunar cycles, okay? As I said last week, that, that's what it's based on. In addition to using the moon for the calendar, the moon is also used in farming. The Farmer's Almanac is based on the lunar cycles. Anyone who gardens seriously will consult with the Almanac in deciding when to plant, when to harvest. So the moon has great effect on crops. Uh, there are four stages of the moon cycle which are important to raising crops. There's the new moon the second quarter, the full moon, and the fourth quarter. Agronomists know that the full moon pulls water because of the the, uh, gravitational pull, pulls water up through the ground that feeds the seeds that have been planted, causing them to open and then to grow. Above-ground produce is best planted right at the new moon. 
The second quarter moon produces less gravitational pull, and, but it, the moonlight is increased, and so that causes a good balance of light for leaf development and growth, both night and during the day. Then after the full moon, moonlight wanes, but the gravitational pull is strong again, and that makes it great for planting root crops. And then the fourth quarter produces, uh, provides less, gravi uh, less gravitational pull in moonlight, and so during this time it's best to, to allow, let's take time for cultivating and for harvesting. I bet you didn't think you'd have a class in agronomy tonight, right? Okay, did you? Um, okay, so let's talk about the, the harvest phase. Harvest primarily took place, uh, and I believe still do, in Israel, primarily during the fourth quarter of the moon. That means they also synchronize with the feast because they occur during the harvest. The barley harvest is the first major harvest by the Jewish people, at least in the spring. God set up for the first of the feast of first fruits to occur during the harvest of barley. In, uh, in Israel, there's three stages to harvesting crops. The, first, uh, the three phases are first fruits, the general harvest, and gleanings. Now, um, and the, the phase of first fruits actually has three phases in it. At the marking, gathering, and presenting. So here's what happened. During the marking and gathering phases, that refers to they would identify that first barley that was maturing, and they would look in the fields and find where it was maturing first, and they would bind it in a sheaf, usually with a red cord that would signify, so they could easily find it, this is uh, the, the chosen barley that's going to be taken to the priest for waving before the Lord of the altar. We read about that in Leviticus 23. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, when you enter the land I'm giving you and reap its harvest, you are to bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. He will present the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. The priest is to present it on the day after Sabbath. That's that Sunday, all right? The day of first fruits. So it is uh, uh, on that week when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, God's plans were now set in motion to be carried out. Jesus fulfilled prophecy from these feasts. He was our Passover lamb uh, that was sacrificed. He was buried on the first of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just as the Afikoman was buried during the, the, uh, uh, the service of Passover, the Seder service. And then he rose uh, symbolically and weighed before God as the first fruit of the final and the eternal resurrection on that glorious Sunday as told in the Gospels. and read about it in Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. All this had to come to pass. Jesus arose on the day of or the feast of first fruits. Paul wrote about it a little bit. We read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read that right here. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as Adam all die, all, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward, at his coming, those to be along the Christ. So Adam brought death to all human beings by introducing us to sin. We're still responsible for our sin, but with Adam came the nature that we have now, the sinful nature. Now, I don't know if you noticed what I just read in 1 Corinthians, but there is an order to the resurrection. God is a God of order. So there's nothing that is out of whack and discombobulated with God. With God, everything is in order. Christ was first, the first fruit. All those who are in Christ will also be raised from the dead, but each in his own order. Did you know that? Now, I don't know what number I am, but I do know that I have a number, okay? I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know how long it's, I'm going to have to wait in line. It's all going to happen in the twinkle of an eye, right? But there's a million, milli, 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 millisecond, you know, that I'm going to have to wait before my number's called and whoosh, away I'm going to go, 
All right? Uh, I don't think the wait's going to be too long. I don't really don't. All right? James 1.18. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So if we are identified with Christ, and I hope and pray that all of you are, we are also seen as the first fruits according to James. Now, let's talk a little bit about harvest and resurrections. The Bible speaks of various harvests and Bible prophecy. Uh, uh, those teachers, those who teach Bible prophecy, point to them, point to harvests as pictures related to the order of resurrection of God's saints. And there is evidence that the order of harvests in Israel depict the order of resurrection of believers and the taking away of unbelievers. The first harvest. As already said, the barley harvest is the first harvest in the spring early spring. Those barley kernels are tossed into the wind to separate the kernels from the chaff, a process that's called winnowing. Winnowing is done because the barley head is soft. It's easily winnowed. There's the second harvest, late spring. That's when wheat is harvested. The head of a wheat kernel is hard. It can't be thrown up in the air and winnowed. That's just not possible. It must be threshed or crushed to separate the wheat from the chaff. In that day, a man who was threshing wheat would stand on, on a large board with bits of glass or stones underneath it, and the board was drug over the wheat to do the crushing. So in Latin, that board is known as uh, tribulum. Tribulum. Now what does that sound like? Revelation 7, starting with verse 9. After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and all along with the elders and the four living creatures and they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessed and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Many people, including Jesus, will come, uh, I'm sorry, including Jews, will come to Christ during the tribulation. It will be tough. It's going to be hard to, to follow Christ during tribulation. Uh, there's going to be torture, martyrdom, I, I am confident because we read about it in Scripture. That will be most likely be the fate of those who come to Christ during tribulation. So let's talk a little about, about the barley versus wheat. There's an interesting fact that differentiates barley from wheat. Let's look at this picture here. You see the picture on the left, the upper picture on the left, that's barley. Uh, the heads of the barley stalk bend downward. It is a picture of people who are bowing in humility. Okay, before its creator. Conversely, look at the heads of the wheat stalks. They remain straight up. They remain straight up. So the barley is easily winnowed, but wheat must go through an act of crushing to separate the kernel from the chaff. Deuteronomy 31. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you are rebelling against the Lord now, while I'm still alive, how much more will you rebel after I am dead? So it was evident that God's people were stiff-necked. They continued to rebel against God. Every time they rebelled, God would put them through the tribulum to break their will and to separate them from the chaff of sin. Now, when it comes to prophecy of what is to come, there are different ways to interpret Scripture as it relates to end times. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds about this, but some believe, as Scripture teaches, the church will go through the Great Tribulation. Those are the post-trib folks. And they say that, that the, everyone, the church and everyone else, is going to go through the Tribulation. Others believe the church will be raptured. 
pre-trib folks, okay? Uh, they say that uh, it's, it's, by reading Scripture, it's evident that the church is raptured prior to, to the tribulation. Some say, well, no, not quite pre-trib. It is mid-trib. So midway through the tribulation period, that's when the church is going to be raptured. No matter which, which, which you choose, and I'm not here to say one way or the other that, that, should, that should be you and studying God's Word and getting clear indication if it really matters. But anyway... No matter what interpretation you choose, God will continually call people unto himself until the final judgment, even throughout the tribulation period. And after that, there won't be an opportunity to choose Christ, because after that you go to the judgment. So we see the church, barley, is going to be resurrected at some point before those who come to Christ during the great tribulation, and they will be raised at the end of that time. In a sense, those who come to Christ and die in the great tribulation are harvested under the crushing of the tribulum. There will be those who come to Christ during the tribulation who will be alive after its conclusion in seven years. Leviticus 19, 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and residents, resident alien. I am the Lord your God. These saints... Who those who receive Christ, they are there throughout the tribulation. So to summarize this harvest picture, we have the first harvest. The barley harvested in the spring, early spring, to provide a picture of the bride of Christ and her rapture. Whenever that might happen. Then the second harvest is the wheat harvest. At the end of spring or early summer, it pictures those who are saved in the great tribulation and die for their faith. And then there are those who are the outer, who are left, who aren't gathered, okay? Those remain to the end. The three phases of first fruits are marking, gathering, and presenting. Back to James 1.18. We are a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The church is the first fruits of barley, as we read here in James, all right? Ephesians 1. In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. So as such, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you've come to Christ, you now the Holy Spirit resides in you. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. These two verses show how the church is marked and then gathered during the rapture. The presenting will occur when? At the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what will be presented to our, uh, to our Creator. Revelation 19.7 Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has prepared herself. All right. Let's talk a little bit now about the parallels with Christ in this feast. There are some parallels of the feast in Christ. All the feasts, I believe, point to Christ and His uh, dealing with humans. In his writings, uh, D. Thomas Lancaster, an author of, of Jewish subjects and one of the main teachers in the ministries of First Fruits of Zion, also uh, the Vine of David, notes a parallel between the order of events of Christ's trial and the timing of the selection and gathering of the barley for first fruits, as stated in the Mishnah. Now, does anyone know what the Mishnah is? Mishnah. Is? Mishnah. It's like a commentary, and it's, it's, a, it's a collection of oral laws, oral writings, which look at the Talmud, the, 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 the scriptures, and they comment on it, they, they uh, uh, make other rules or clarifications, what they, they think they need clarification. So um, uh, it, it's a, it's a, essentially it's a, a Jewish commentary on, on the Old Testament. So at, the, at about the time that Caiaphas, the high priest, was trying Jesus, the servants of the disciples, according to the Mishnah, the servants of the disciples of the Sanhedrin were in the barley field judging the crop to decide what was going to be harvested for first fruits. Okay? That's an important thing. The day that the Romans were binding up Jesus for crucifixion, the disciples of the Sanhedrin were binding up the barley sheaf for the first fruits. See how the ties of Christ? On the Sunday, the first day of the week, Jewish life begins for the week because the day before the Sabbath, 
No work is done on the Sabbath. It's time of rest and time of worship. On that Sunday, Mary went to the tomb. It was the day after the Sabbath and the day of the Feast of First Fruits. Look at John 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Then on to verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stopped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. When Mary looked into the tomb, she saw two angels. One commentary noted that what Mary was witnessing was really was a live display of the mercy seat. If you recall the mercy seat, there's cherubim on either end of the mercy seat. Um, I'm not sure whether we can make that leap, but in any event, Mary saw angelic beings in the tomb, which meant that the tomb was no longer in the hands of humans. It was now enveloped in the mystery of God. Jesus arose from the dead and walked out of that tomb alive. Alive, as alive as you and me are. John 20, verse 17 this is a verse, don't cling to me, Jesus told Mary, since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. I've always been puzzled by this. Why did he not let her touch him? And then later we read that Jesus invited Thomas to touch him. What, what's up with that? Why did he say that? Um, that must mean that um, he said earlier that he, that he has not ascended to the Father. That must mean that sometime between when he talked with Mary and when he talked with Thomas, there must have been an ascension, right? Would it make sense? All right. Um, as I examined various commentaries, they suggested that really there's, there's a misunderstanding of the word ascending, okay? They're trying to, to make things make sense. And that John really didn't mean what we think the word means. Um, they state that the purpose of the ascent statement of Jesus was a misunderstanding, and um, it, it really didn't mean touch. Some believe that, that really what Jesus was was spirit. He wasn't physical, okay? Um, I think that's wrong. Uh, and that Mary could no longer relate, nor we could no longer relate to the resurrected Lord through a physical sense because the ascension would terminate such encounters. So as a result, clinging to the physical patterns of the pre-resurrected Lord was no longer possible. That, that belief does not make sense when we talk about Thomas and Jesus inviting Thomas to touch him so that he would believe. Others wrote that uh, Jesus ascended on Easter and that they, uh, the notation in Acts was, uh, was just a figure. Remember in Acts we read Jesus' final ascension? Uh, they said, well, no, that really happened in John, and it was just a, uh, uh, it was a, a notation. It was a figurative language. Uh, basically, what I, I guess to, to encapsulate all that I read in commentaries, they all punted. When you don't have any other plays to play, what do you do? You punt. Uh, there was one exception, one exception. One commentary pointed to the words of Flavius Josephus. Remember that character we talked about last week? Who was he? He was a, uh, a, a member of the temple priesthood, and Josephus uh, wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, which is a historical account of the Jews uh, in a, 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 for over a great number of years, of which Jesus lived. Okay, And so Josephus makes note of Jesus. In, uh, in his writings, in his account, historical account of the Jewish people. So Jesus, or Josephus wrote on, that, on the barley, on, on that the barley was to be part of the feast of the first fruits. It could not be touched beforehand. Okay? Um, uh, what am I saying? Uh, it couldn't be touched by anyone until it was presented to God by the priest. And once it was presented, then it could be harvested for you. So then you could go to the harvest and, and, uh, with the rest of the crop. So what am I saying? Jesus was the first fruit. 
He had to go to the Father before anyone could touch him, just as the first fruit of the barley could not be touched until the priest waved it before God, presented it to God. Uh, so I believe that Jesus went before the Father. He presented himself before the Father as the first fruit. And then, once he had, Thomas could then touch him. One other thing about the barley sheaf, it was harvested in the sheaf or omer was offered in the temple. Uh, so the rest of the crop, you know, they, they take the one sheaf and they present it before God in the temple. And once they do that, then the rest of the crop is considered kosher. Now what does kosher mean? Clean, yeah. Uh, it's it's more than that. It, it's it's considered um, acceptable to God, lawfully fit. In other words, okay. Look at John, First uh, John two two. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours but also for those of the whole world. One way to look at this verse is that we are now kosher, so to speak, because. Christ has been presented before, uh, the, before God the Father, and so the rest of the harvest is now kosher, and that is us. The field of barley became kosher through the presentation of the first fruits to God at the temple. The barley in the field did nothing to become kosher. Didn't do it. Do we? No, we don't do anything to be acceptable before God. In the same way we have been made acceptable to God by Jesus, our first fruits, when he presented himself to the Father. As the barley in the field did nothing to become kosher, likewise, we did nothing to become kosher except belief, of course. Isn't it interesting that God designed the activity of marking, gathering, and presenting the barley sheaf, the first, the fruit, and, con and coincided it exactly with the death, resurrection, and presentation uh, to God. Jews still don't believe in the parallel, to be, to be honest. Uh, they don't believe in the parallel of this feast to Christ, or the, actually the Passover, uh, the, the, the feast of uh, unleavened bread, and then the feast of, of uh, first fruits. Some Christians don't, Some, unfortunately. They don't acknowledge uh, Christ, uh, especially when I see the comments uh, on uh, John twenty seventeen, where they're all over the board, uh, trying to uh, make sense of this word, don't touch me, okay? However, one day God's chosen, chosen people will see. Look at Zechariah 12.10. Then I will pour out my spirit of grace and prayer in the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. All right. What can we make of this as far as trying to draw from this and apply some things to our lives um, as we move forward? The first thing is giving of first fruits. And Alan uh, kind of referred to this as an act of faith. God accepted the sheaf for the whole harvest. As we've seen so far, the feasts of God were given to the Jewish people, and they were pictures of what God did and what he was going to do in a greater way through Jesus Christ. Jesus was the priest and the barley sheaf. Because Jesus was acceptable to God as the first fruit, we as the crop, we as the, the rest of the field, are now kosher. We're acceptable, righteous before God. Christ fulfilled the picture that God gave the Jewish people of what was to come. Centuries before Jesus was on the scene here, before he walked the earth. Something else is uh, I like to point out as we draw conclusions and applications. In all the harvests, God commanded his people to give their offering from the first fruits, from the first gleanings, from the first gatherings. Now for a farmer, that's a big ask. That's a big commandment. Why is that? Anyone want to take a guess? Versus your best, that's one point. Yep, best of everything, I agree, yep. There's something else. 
What is the farmer totally dependent on that he can't control? The weather. So when I say I'm taking my first fruit, whatever percentage it was, and there's different variations and arguments on what that is, what I'm saying is, God, I'm giving you my best, my first. Because I'm doing that, I am totally reliant upon you to help me see the harvest be achieved. I am dependent on you, God. A storm could come through tomorrow, locust, whatever it might be. I have no control over that. So I got to depend on you, Lord. If you don't allow me to harvest the rest of the crop, then that means I won't have anything to eat. That means I won't be able to feed my family. That means I won't have grain to plant next season. That means I won't have anything to sell. I'm depending on you, God. That should be our attitude when it comes to our tithes and offerings. We shouldn't give God our leftovers and say, God, i got to take care of all my needs first, and then if I have anything left over, you got it. It's not the way it works with God. What God says is, give for me, give to me from your first. Rely on me. Giving of tithes and offerings is the only place where God provides a promise if we're faithful. He'll take care of us. I had a, a pastor that married us that I, in high school when I grew up. You know, we, Ron and I got married, we moved away. And uh, I think I've told this story before. They came through with some other leaders of the church. They were going on a mission trip, and they stopped by us to see us because we were now living out, out of state from where my parents and, and everybody was. And uh, they stopped and got to talk with him for a few hours. And he asked a few pointed questions. Where are you going to church? <laughs> and uh, uh, are you giving your tithe to the church? New couple? Eh, no, no. He, he gave me a suggestion, and, he, and it, I'm telling you what, it worked <laughs> for me. And I think it will work for anybody. He said, I know you're, 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 you're really scared about giving 10% of your tithe. Try, with one, try one. Say, God, I'm giving you 1%. Provide for me. And if you do it and for however long, see if God does not bless you. And if he blesses you, you have money left over, you go to 2% and say, God, I'm upping it. You've got to take care of my bills. You've got to help me. Just keep upping it and see if God will not work in your life. And let me tell you, he worked. Ron and I have been taught, not that I'm trying to brag, so please don't, please don't read into this anything. We, we do more than tithe. But um, it started when we first got married. We weren't. We didn't. But I, I won't say tested God, but in a way I did it. So God, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm relying on you. And he was faithful so I could give more. And he was faithful. So I could give more. And he was faithful. Um, so I offer that as an encouragement to you. That if, you, if you're not giving of your first, uh, try it. God commands it. He desires it. It's really you're saying, I'm going to give to you, Lord. Please take care of me. He'll be faithful. All right? Secondly, Christ arose on the day of the feast. Look at Luke 24 again. On the first day of the week... She goes out there and found the storm, rolled away, Mary did, and went in, but did not find the body of Lord Jesus. Jesus arose on the day of first fruits, the uh, uh, feast of first fruits, the day after Sabbath, the, day, the first day of the week. You know, that's why we as a, first, as a Christian church celebrate, that's why we worship on Sundays. We celebrate our risen Savior. We also are following suit with what the early church did. There are some Christian denominations which meet on Saturday. They want to uphold the Sabbath laws. We're free of that now. Uh, we celebrate a risen Savior. Um, look, look at Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this we are, uh, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes what, is see, what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. I, I don't know what you're going through tonight. I know some of you, and I know some of the things that you're going through. But I don't know everything about your lives. I also know that many people suffer silently and alone. I urge you tonight to find a trusted brother or sister in Christ and share with them your heart and your hurt. That's why God gave us a church. It's one of the functions of a church is to hold each other up in prayer and support. Uh, listening when we, we're just venting. <laughs> My wife likes to, to vent sometimes. She says, don't give me any uh, uh, advice. I just want you to listen. That's okay. So she vents and I listen. That's what we're here for. Don't suffer alone in silence. And also understand that God allows suffering to grow us, knowing that our reward will exceedingly surpass anything that we go through here on earth. He doesn't want us to suffer alone. He is always with us, and he provides us with fellow human beings, brothers and sisters in Christ, that can bring his comfort in trying days. We also need to remember that the effects of sin condition of mankind go far beyond we as human beings. All of creation is suffering because of sin. All of creation groans and moans anticipating the redemption. But we also have the Spirit as the first fruit as we wait. We have hope. And remember, the biblical term of hope, as we read in Scripture, is not, oh man, I hope it happens. I'm not sure whether it will, but I just hope and pray that it will. No. Hope, according to God's word, is a confident expectation. When God says it, mark it down. It is going to work. When we hope in Christ, we know where we're going. We know that he is going to return. But we must remember to do it with patience, as Scripture tells us. He's trying to teach us. So instead of saying, God, why me? Say, God, teach me. Help me. Remember, the day is coming. I almost asked Alan to, to uh, sing this song, but or sing it, but coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Finally. Oop, I didn't, I missed this thing there. We have a numbered ticket. You know, modern travel is very organized. Uh, you can order online or whatever and get a guaranteed seat when you're traveling by air or sea or whether you're traveling on land, via the, whether it's a bus or a train. Uh, at one time, Southwest, I don't let this do it because I don't travel like I did when I was in the corporate world, but um, I used to travel a lot when I, uh, anyway. Southwest Airlines um, <coughs> didn't assign you a seat, but when you got there, if you got there the earliest, then you got ticket number one, and then ticket number two, three, four, so your ability to get on and get the seat that you want depended on how quickly you arrived, Okay. Back to this 1 Corinthians 15 passage. I don't read it again. But it tells me that there is an order in the great resurrection of the saints. 
And it is numbered based on when you get there, when you come to Christ, okay? Doesn't mean that you're going to get a poor seat. <laughs> With Southwest Airlines, man, you, you get the last number, you're going to get the seat clear at the back, you know, when it's all cramped up in the corner or whatever. But with God, no. You may be the last person that comes to Christ, and you're the last person that has a ticket to number, and you're the last one that that's rose from the dead. But let me tell you, what Christ has prepared for us, whew, it'll knock your socks off, folks. It tells me that there's a great resurrection, uh, an order of saints. Christ arose as our first fruit. So my question is, or my, my, my suggestion, if you don't have a ticket, if you don't have a ticket, you're unsure if you uh, are going or not. You're not sure whether you have a reservation via salvation. Please don't let this, this time pass. Please. Don't leave this place without knowing for sure that I have a resurrection ticket. Jesus is coming for me. And just as Jesus arose from the grave, I too am going to arise one day. If you're not sure, and those of you who are watching online, if you're not sure, all you need to do is with a repentant heart, meaning I'm leaving the way that I'm living. It's not working for me. I'm leaving. I'm walking away from sin and self. I'm changing directions, and I'm now going to live for Jesus Christ. I need to ask him, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Be my master and my savior. And when you pray that prayer with an honest and true heart, just like that, Scripture tells us that you are now a new creation. You got your ticket. You will arise from the grave just as Jesus did. If you pray that prayer online or if you uh, pray that prayer here tonight, I would love to talk with you. I know Philip would love to talk. Please call the church office and we would love to talk with you about your decision that you made and, uh, and help you in growing in your relationship with Christ. I'd be happy to help you in that regard. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time. And if there's someone in this room or someone watching online, I pray, Lord, that, that they would pray this, pray this prayer, that they say, God, I am a sinful person. There is sin in my life. I have walked away from you in so many ways, and that's separated me from you. And that means I, once I die, I won't be with you for eternity, and I want that. So, Lord, I'm coming to you tonight. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I want to change directions in the way that I'm living. I want to stop living for myself and, and living in sin. I want to now live for you. Forgive me, Lord. Look upon me with mercy. Become my Lord and Savior this moment. And if you pray that prayer, Lord, asking the Lord to, to forgive you, he is faithful and just to forgive you. God, I hope if someone's prayed that prayer that they'll get with someone to help them as they now live a life following Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you arose. You are the first fruits that the Jewish people celebrated for generations prior to your arrival, prior to your birth, prior to your death, prior to your resurrection. And I pray, Lord, for the people, uh, your people, the Jewish people, who still uh, celebrate the feast but don't see you in that. I pray that you would open their eyes and their minds that all of these feasts point to you. And that they would come to the realization that the Messiah that they long for, that they're still looking for, is right before them in Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you arose I thank you for the hope and the promise that we too who call upon Christ as Lord and Savior, we too will rise one day should you tarry and we go and we die before you return. There is the resurrection. We look forward to that, Lord. But as we grow older, as our bodies age and, and as they begin to fail us, 
whether it's just from age or whether it's from sickness, illness, or whatever it might be, Lord, I pray that you would be a comfort to us. I pray that we would not be so proud that we would not seek out people that we can, uh, can, can come al- that we can invite to come alongside us and help us. For you created us, you, you designed us to be uh, a communal people. That's what you made the church for, that we would be a support to one another. And I pray that those who are suffering would seek out uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ to do that. God, I thank you for the church. I thank you for the, 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 the privilege of serving you here. And I, I pray, Lord, that we all would, would, uh, would um, be honest and open with each other as we strive to live each and every day for you. Take us from this place, Lord, I pray. I pray that we've learned something tonight, but I also pray that we've grown and we've seen some things maybe that we need to change or how we can grow to be more in conformance with you. And Lord, as we leave, help us to go boldly, uh, to, to face this world that seems to be in chaos with the assurance that we are your um, uh, possession. We are your child. And may we be bold in our faith, inviting those to come to know what we know, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for giving yourself to us. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.